Euh, ici. There. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I will talk about entanglement in quantum field theory in general. Um, I plan these lectures. The first one today will be about entanglement entropy in quantum field theory, some general facts. Uh, I think the next one, I will talk about the reversibility theorems in terms of entanglement entropy. The next one uh, about energy entropy bounds. And the last one will be about symmetries and how you can describe symmetries in terms of algebras and uh, entropic order parameters. <clears throat> So let me say that I, I, I do not know exactly how far I, I will go because it depends on how many questions, et cetera. But I have all uploaded to the wiki um, some quite complete set of notes that you can, you can look at that. Um, I will not be able to cover all the things that are in the wiki uh, in, the, in the notes, um, but uh, there, are, there are also exercises there. If you, if you want to ask about some exercise, we can discuss it. Um, so let us start the, the lecture for today. I will talk all in me. Today, I will talk about entanglement entropy. In quantum field theory. So in, in this, in, in quantum field theory, people call entanglement entropy just to the entropy of some region. So you take a region of the space and you wonder how much entropy is inside and how. So it's, a, in the, it's the entropy of a region. in a theory with the continuum number or degrees of freedom. <clears throat> so uh, you can think well, but this is somehow similar to what, uh, what uh, you, you may have calculated in uh, statistical mechanics, the entropy, for example, in a thermal state. But the difference is that here we are interested in a, in a finite region. So uh, we do not take the, no take the large volume limit. Uh, and also, we do not impose any boundary conditions there. The boundary conditions will 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 put some other element to the theory that we do not we do not want to put any any anything external to the theory to the quantity we want we want to compute. And the other thing is that typically. We are interested in the vacuum, the vacuum. So the vacuum state. So you will say, well, zero the entropy. Well, that's the point. The, the point is that it cannot be zero if you don't, if you if you do not put boundary conditions, because the state is uh, is obtained by tracing the vacuum in the global space outside, and then it, it contains some entropy, that in that particular case where, <clears throat> where the state is pure, is really entanglement, is entanglement entropy, as you have uh, learned in the last, in last week, that uh, you, you, you have a pure state, you have um, some, some uh, in this case, some subalgebra or some tensor product of field spaces, and then you reduce the state and you get some non-zero entropy. So I will take a pedestrian approach to this, and, and we will think in a cutoff theory. Um, mm. 
because we have to deal with the infinite number, the continued number of degrees of freedom. So this will cause us some problems, but let us start thinking in a cutoff theory. <clears throat> so for example, lattice. And then we will take the continuum limit. For example, here I have I have plot um, a square in a square lattice in two in two spatial dimensions, and we want to understand how the the entropy of this region behaves. So. For having a, a very simple example that you can compute uh, actually in a computer, um, uh, let us think in a free massless scalar. In two plus one dimensions, so two, dim two spatial dimensions. <clears throat> uh, and then, we can compute the density, the, we, we have the density matrix in some this region, in this, inside this region. Let's call it row B, is the density matrix. And from here, we compute the entropy by the von Neumann formula. Yes. Where the density matrix is just defined such that you can compute expectation values of operators inside the region, some operator inside the region, some operator here. And this is just the expectation value, right? This is the definition of the density matrix is some, is some um, operator itself, which, uh, which reproduces this, this computation. So for the free massless scale, scalar, the state is a Gaussian. Gaussian means uh, it obeys a weak theorem. For, for correlators. And that means that the, uh, the two point functions Has all the information of the theory, right? So if you, if you want to compute uh, multiple multi-point uh, correlation functions, it's just a sum of products of two-point functions. Then in, that, in this situation, the density matrix uh, has to the density matrix has to reproduce the weak theorem, and it has always this form that is, let's, let's call it phi, phi i, the, the degrees of freedom, the, the fields at the different points of the lattice is uh, an exponential density matrix is an exponential of a quadratic form in the basic variables, canonical variables, where uh, where pi i is just phi i dot. And this is this reproduces the, the, weak, the weak theorem. And then you have to uh, calibrate what is m and n using the two point functions. So you have, you compute the two point function inside the, the region that you are interested in, in this case, the, the square. And the same for the momentum variables. And so everything, this M and N are functions of these matrices. And of course the, the entropy is also a function of these matrices and the entropy you can compute it and is defining another matrix that is the square root of XP the entropy is just the trace of 
There is always logarithms in the entropy. So then if you, if you have the correlators, you can compute uh, analytically the correlators for the scalar field in the lattice, in the, in the full lattice, and then you reduce your correlators just in the region you are interested in. Compute these matrices with these two matrices, X and P. <clears throat> Sorry, right there. Uh, you can compute, um, you can compute uh, the entropy just computing the eigenvalues of, of this matrix C. And then you plot, you can plot, you can compute the entropy, you can, com you can compute the entropy for a square like this one. There's a little bit of delay. Um, but, it, and then the interest is to go to the continuum limit. What, what means continuum limit here? The continuum limit means that you have to put more and more lattice points inside your square, or what in this case that I'm talking about the massless field is the same as enlarging the size of the square with respect to the lattice. So you plot the entropy as a function of the length of the, of the size of the, of, the, of the side of the square, and you get some function that is linear, as you see here. The entropy is linear with the size of, of the square. Uh, but if you look at it more carefully, what you get is that uh, it is mounted on, on top of this linear function. There is also a logarithmic function that is drawn here. Uh, so you, you can fit your curve uh, on, the, on the left and you can extract the linear term and you get a logarithmic function that is plot in the, in the second part of the, uh, in the second picture. So can if I you ask, want to write, yes. Uh, is the logarithmic part because we're thinking about massless fields? No, uh, well, no, uh, is, yes, if, if, if you have a massive field, well, you, you still get some logarithmic uh, diversions, right? I, I, will, I will talk about that, but uh, you, it will depend on. It will not depend on on the, on the length of of the of the. If your if your square is larger than the mass, it will stop depending on the on the size of the the square. It will depend on the mass only. Good, thanks. So. Um, Analytic function for this is just you write uh, what you get, and you get 0 0.75 in fact in, from the computer, and then it's perimeter over epsilon. So it means perimeter because it increases, increases linearly with the size. Epsilon is uh, just uh, the lattice spacing. And then there is a logarithmic term. This is what you get uh, with the actual numbers. So the, the first observation is that the entropy, oh, this is, diverges in the continuum limit. So as epsilon goes to zero, this will diverge with the perimeter. This typically, this, this term that is the leading part is, is usually called the area term. Here we are in two plus one dimension, so the area is just the perimeter, the boundary of the region. But now you can also, you have the, your program in, the, in your lattice, then you can start computing other things. For example, this object here in the left is, uh, is also is, has a square size, but has more vertices than the square. And what you get there is
So you get uh, the same perimeter law, but the coefficient of the logarithmic term is multiplied by uh, six over four with respect to the, the square. And you can think, well, it is because now I have, um, I have six vertices and before I had just four. And, and then you can think, well, what happens if, I, if my square is, uh, is, uh, is uh, rotated, is rotated in the lattice, is not uh, in the parallel direction of the lattice. And then what you get is entropy So you get exactly the same, the same logarithmic coefficient, but the perimeter term, the area term is different. It has a different coefficient. Then in, in this Excuse case, me. yes. Is L equal to the perimeter? L, L is the size, is the size. The perimeter is just for L, let's say. Okay. In, in the, for the square, in this case, it contains, in this case, it contains all the pieces, right? Okay. It's just a perimeter measure in the, in the lattice units. Um, and, the, and then what you get is that the area term is what is called non-universal. Non-universal means it depends on the regularization. It depends on, on how I define my square in the lattice, et cetera. And this is an object that does not belong to the quantum field theory. It belongs to the way you arrive to it. So it does not belong to the continuum theory. So uh, is, we are not interested in this. For, for us, we are not interested. We want to compute things that belong to the, to the quantum field theory independently on, on the way you arrive to it. Uh, so the coefficient of the logarithmic term is universal. It doesn't matter how you put your square, you get the same number. And also, and also is all is also proportional to the number of vertices. Question? Yes. Is this something that you can just check in a lot of different numerical examples, or is there some, you know? general well, analytic calculation you can do that gives you this uh, universality? Uh, you can compute it, uh, the, this angular term, for example, for a scalar, you can compute it analytically in, 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 a, in a completely different way, very far away from, from the calculation in the lattice and this is the same number. Uh, and you can check with many calculations in the lattice that give you the same. Um, um, I, I must say that if you have an, a different theory, for example, that is not free, it's much harder to do these type of calculations in the lattice, right? So we will, we will turn to some methods uh, uh, to compute things in the, in the continuum itself later. Um, Does this only work for 90 degree angles? No, no. Well, I was going to say something about that. More generally, uh, the logarithmic part is in fact given by some sum over the vertices, some function of the angles of the vertices and log epsilon. The, the diversion piece will go with the log epsilon and a sum over the different vertices of a function of the angle, right? Here, uh, I took all 
angles are 90 degrees, so the coefficients are always the same, just the number of vertices. But if the angles change, then uh, the coefficient will change accordingly. Uh, it's important that this angle and this angle give you the same contribution. And th this you can think, think is related to the fact that the entropy of a region is equal to the entropy of let me call B prime is a complement. And this holds if the global state is pure, as in this case uh, with the vacuum state, right? So, uh, well, but you say, well, but uh, how is this related? Because uh, here, uh, looking at this point, well, okay, um, um, the contribution around this point may be equal to this point, to, to the, the outside part, but uh, the, the object itself is, is, uh, is very different from the one in the outside part, right? The complement. However, the, the fact is that uh, you, let us try to understand how this structure arises. Mm -hmm. So these are, um, these are contributions to the entropy that are, that are divergent, right? It means that as you go to a smaller and more, a smaller lattice, uh, you have more and more contributions and, and these are ultraviolet contributions. So they have to arise because of correlations at very short distances uh, across the boundary between the inside and outside. Mm -hmm. And as, uh, as a correlation of short wavelength, if I have a, a very large square, they will not talk to each other. So these correlations will not talk to these ones and these ones. So it will happen that the diversion pieces, the, the diversion contributions to the entropy uh, must be uh, lo local on the boundary of the region mm -hmm. uh, and extensive. So they, they are like a summed over all the, the points of the boundary. Mm -hmm. And this is what we are seeing in practice here because we have a perimeter term that is local, is a version and local on the boundary. And we have also a logarithmic term that is also local because it is uh, summed over all vertices. So it's something that uh, arises because of the feature of the vertex and the correlations bear near, very near the vertex. So this, this um, gives us uh, a way to understand the general structure. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, how do I understand why the number of vertexes, uh, vertices is so uh, like central to the logarithmic term? Well, the logarithmic term, let me say that the logarithmic term comes because this, this term, this term does, uh, so you have to assign a diversion contribution, a diversion contribution to a feature on the boundary that is a point, is a vertex, right? So it doesn't have any real, any dimension full quantity. So the only way, uh, for example, the perimeter, you have the perimeter and then you compensate with epsilon here in this way, but the logarithmic term doesn't have any, any um, the, the diversion, the diversion piece log epsilon um, doesn't, doesn't have any, any, anything to clinch in, in the geometry. To have a dimensionally, dimensionally thing, so it can only be a logarithm, right? So this this L that I put here is somehow undetermined. If I if I change what I what I call L, it will change by a constant term here. So it it will go in this way under under scaling, let's say. But if I change what what the meaning of L according to my geometry of the region then it will, it will just change uh, by a constant, but it will not change the coefficient. So the, the reason why it's a logarithm is because it's attached to a feature of the boundary that is dimensionless. 
in this case. Or, or you, you can also say that as, as, you, as you zoom in in the vertex, as you put uh, the limit of the continuum, you are adding more and more contributions. And, and, and each time you double the size of the lattice, you add one more wavelength, let's say. Then in this way, you are adding one wavelength each time you double, and then it gives a logarithm. If you, if you do the calculation, it gives you a logarithm because it's changing. Uh, additively under under scaling. Thank you. So uh, the general um, structure. Can I ask one more question? Yeah. Um, more generally, is it going to be like instead of just the sum over the vertices, is it going to be uh, something with, having to do with the curvature of the boundary? Yeah, exactly. I, I am okay. going to describe that exactly. Oh, I see. Okay. So let us think now uh, smooth boundaries. Yes, so we have a region, the smooth boundary, and then <clears throat> we have a um, we have we have said that the, the the diversion pieces are local and extensive on the boundary. So. Yes, because it's, uh, these are short wavelength ultraviolet uh, contributions. <clears throat> so uh, we can write the entropy then is as a sum of the, the diversion pieces. We can sum. We can we can write as a sum of different. Let us call this boundary sigma uh, of some function of sigma. Um, epsilon to the sum powers in general. And then there is also a finite piece. Yes, the, this CI are functions of the boundary that are local and extensive. So it means that in this case will be, in this case of a smooth boundary will be given by integrals along the boundary. Then it also depends on the ultraviolet physics and the geometry. Uh, we can also think it is independent of the state. Because for very short wavelength, we expect the state similar is similar to the vacuum. So it is it, it should be independent of the state, of the particular state, these diversion pieces. And finally, it has dimension. lambda i because the, the entropy is dimensionless. Can I ask a question? So, yes. Um, are you assuming something about these geometries being convex? Because if they are concave, then local correlations might be with other points inside the surface itself. No, no, not at all. Not at all. As I, as I mentioned before, if you have, a, if you have this, let, let me think you have a piece of the surface like this. Um, the, the, the contributions, this diversion contribution will be local and will be the same for this part and for this part because of this property is by is V is equal to S by B prime, right? So 
the entropies are equal. No, what I'm thinking about is something like, say, a horseshoe shape, where the two legs of the horseshoe are really close to each other. Ah, okay, no, okay, but we are fixing the geometry first and doing the cutoff going to zero first, right? So, so you, 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 you are thinking something like this. Yes. Something like this. When this when this is small. Yes. Right? No, but I always take epsilon smaller than anything. I see. Okay. Because it's a, this is the definition of a cutoff, right? We want to go to the continuum. We want to the, the thing that is in the continuum for a fixed geometry, for a fixed masses of the theory, etc. I see. Okay, thank you. <laughs> One more question. Oh. Go ahead, Simon. Yeah. Sorry. yeah, so you were saying that like the CI is independent of the state because when you zoom in enough. I cannot, I cannot hear well. Yeah, you were saying that like CI is independent of the state because when you zoom in enough, it's a process vacuum. But like, uh, is it possible like the theory undergoes some phase transformation, phase transformation that actually changes the structure of vacuum, like around a specific temperature? So your CI will depend on that state. Yeah, well, sure. for example, all, all the, for example, you, I, I, I didn't hear it very well, but I, I guess you are asking about phase, phase, phases, different phases or something that yeah, exactly. may happen in the theory, right? So okay. uh, all those, all those features will be reflected in the, in the entanglement entropy, but they all will be in this part, this part, is the, the one that has all the information, uh, the finite piece. In particular, for example, the thermal piece, if you, if you get a region very large with respect to the thermal wavelength, then you, you will have a volume term here because of the temperature, right? So all the things you can see in this part of the entropy. I'm talking now on the diversion pieces that I really quite independent of, of, of what happens at different scales in the theory, right? Uh, for example, example, let us take a CFT. So it's a, it's a theory without any scales in D equal to four. And to simplify for a sphere of radius, are. So we write our entropy is just some term. Uh, we have uh, the di let us write first the diversion pieces is, is an integral over the surface of the sphere. Over uh, uh, and we can put there the, the just the measure of the surface divided by epsilon square, right? This is the only thing. Uh, be, because this is epsilon square is just to kill the, the dimensions. And then we can integrate other things. We can integrate other things. Let me call the coefficient 2a. And here I can put the curvature, the curvature, the, the intrinsic curvature of the surface of the sphere, right? But now this, have, this thing doesn't have dimensions. Hmm? This thing doesn't have dimensions. And in fact, you can compute this, uh, this quantity. Uh, this is uh, just two for a sphere. It's dimensionless, it's a number, it's two. And then as this does not have dimensions, you, can ha you have to put here for a diversion contribution, for a diversion contribution, you have to put here a log epsilon. So, and this, Two are the only things that, that you can put there because there are not, there is no one over epsilon term because you cannot write something that is purely geometric and um, uh, is, and it's an integral, a geometric integral on the boundary of the sphere because uh, you you have this thing that is the area term and you you take away two dimensions by integrating the curvature but there is nothing you can put with less dimension. So what, once you have this logarithm epsilon here, it, uh, this is dimensionless, but not so. It's uh, logarithmic dimensions has. So it has to be compensated by something else. So you have to put here 4a log r. 
in order that really is now a dimensional thing, right? And, and this is now is not a diversion piece, it's a finite piece. Mm -hmm. It's a finite piece whose coefficient is determined by this one, of course, these two here. And then you can add some arbitrary constant there. Mm -hmm. And there is no, this, this, is a, this has to be the structure of the entropy for a sphere in a CFT. <clears throat> uh, but now consider what happens for a quantum field theory. So there is a scales. It's not a conformal field theory anymore, it has some scales. Uh, for a sphere again, d equal to four, and for a small r. So we are in the ultraviolet regime. So uh, we can describe the viral regime saying that the theory approaches the action, uh, approaches the action of a CFT plus some perturbation. Let's call it ultra, G ultraviolet is the coupling constant. And here we put some field of the theory of some dimension delta according to the, to the fixed point, the, the, the CFT in the ultraviolet. And let us call this UB. So uh, because um, <clears throat> this phi delta is a, uh, what is called a relevant operator, It means that the dimension of this, uh, so let, let me, the dimension delta of the field has to be uh, smaller than d and greater or equal than d minus two over two. This is the unitarity bound, has to be greater than the dimension of a, of a free scalar and this is just because it's relevant. Otherwise, if I put a, a, a perturbation with an operator of higher dimension than D, this, this will not, this theory will not approach in the for short distances to the CFT. Hmm? So in the, under, under these conditions, I, I will try again to write the, the entropy. We have an area term. So this was the area term before. We have an area term. We have the C2 e to the minus two, epsilon to the minus two that we had before. But now I have also other things with, with dimensions, this G mu nu, G, this G ultraviolet, sorry, has dimensions. This G has dimension uh, D minus D minus delta. Hmm? So we have dimension full quantities. So here we can we can write C prime. In general, this this thing will be perturbatively computable, and then if some power of G. In, in general, it, it starts with the G square term, and here we have a power that is the term of, of epsilon. That is determined just by dimensional analysis. Plus, it can be something else. This is the area term, divergent area term. All powers of the cutoff are negative. So, in that case, we need that delta UB is greater than d plus two over two in order to have a new diversion contribution. Otherwise, we don't have a new diversion contribution in the area term. And then we have the logarithmic term. Plus some constant again. And we can also write what we expect to have as a perturbative contribution in the finite term, 
again, just writing G square and then something with R that is that has the right dimensions. As we see, the power here is positive. So when we go to R equal to zero, this, this is smaller and smaller as it must be, and it approaches and it approaches the full entropy approaches the one of a conformal field theory. Except, of course, by the new diversion contribution that will be always there, but it's affecting all, always the area term. Um, and let us think now in the infrared regime. So again, a sphere. Uh, D equal to four uh, are going to infinity. So the infrared regime, sorry. So in this case, we have to understand a little bit more what we expect because now we want to understand the contributions, not only diversion contributions. Suppose we have this sphere, and R is very, very large. So R is very large with respect to some scale, let's call it lambda, this mass scale of the theory. Uh, so this is very large. So the typical scale, where the masses of the coupling constant of the theory uh, are important is, is much smaller than R. So again, where these this, this massive scales can, um, can affect the entanglement entropy, it has to be in correlations between the inside and outside of the order lambda. So it's, it's something, these correlations all around this region in a region in a size lambda to the minus one, right? All correlations between the inside and outside that are larger scale from that. So these correlations are dominated by the CFT infrared. So at very large scales, we can think the theories again, a CFT, uh, a new a new CFT, the CFT of the infrared fixed point, let's say. So uh, then we want to write the entropy. So we start writing the diversion pieces. We know that they do not change, so they are exactly the same. It depends only on the divided fixed point. So it depends only on what happens for very short distances. This is the diversion pieces, all affect the area term. And then here, I can write something new, some finite term. This is finite, this is not diversion. And why I write it in the area term? Because we can understand the contribution from the masses, from the masses, physical masses of the theory in the infrared regime with very large sphere. In the same way, we understood the contributions from the diversion pieces for, for any theory. Why? Because, this, because these contributions, again, are all local and extensive on the boundary. So there, there should be some contribution that now is finite affecting the area term. This is the area term. Then we have also the uh, the logarithmic term is again the same as before. The derivation piece is the same. But now in the same way, we, have, we can have another contribution due to the theory, to the theory in, uh, uh, at the scales of order lambda, which is logarithmic, but depends on this lambda, on this mass scale of the theory, let's say. And why I, I put it like this, because it's, it's again here, here is a, a local contribution, this one, for the sphere, this 
should have some number two there that is just the integral of the curvature. Right? It's a local contribution again, because I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, uh, at, the, at the thing very from very far away, I see the contribution of actual physical masses are, are, are for me are similar as, as the contribution for ultraviolet divergences. They are local and extensive on the boundary. So, but now in order to compensate for these two terms, I have to write another term, the logarithmic dimensions, have to be killed by a, log a logarithm of R. This is a finite piece. And then I can also write some constant. And I could write some leading non-local term dominated by some dimension full, uh, some, sorry, some dimension of, of a field that is a, um, an irrelevant operator. That is the one that dominates the approach to the conformal field fixed point at the infrared. So we see that now we have a, a, different, a different coefficient for the logarithmic term. So the, in the infrared, the logarithmic piece will, will be the finite term will be growing with R in this way. So we have A infrared is equal to A ultraviolet, the coefficient of the logarithm minus some X that it depends on how the theory has changed between the infrared and the ultraviolet. <clears throat> Um, so as, as a conclusion in the infrared, uh, the, the, the lambda dependent term result where these are physical scales result from replacing the cutoff in the diversion pieces. Here, for example, we have a log epsilon and here we have log lambda. And uh, here we have epsilon square, and we have here some lambda square that changed the area, the area terms. So let me now move to describe more shader things. So uh, what, what we have seen then is that the entropy is divergent. And then we, we can ask, uh, what is the real quantity, the mathematically well-defined quantity that depends on the theory of the continuum itself? Uh, and that, um, for that, we can, we can take advantage. So let me, let me ask what that, what does, Does survive the continuum limit. Or, or, or in other terms, we have seen some pieces of the entropy that are well-defined objects of the continuum limit, like the coefficient of the limit term. Uh, one, could, one could expect also to have uh, some other contributions. Um, what is the general method to understand what pieces are universal? That, that's, that's the question behind it. So the entropy is not universal. 
but we can construct with the entropy something that is called the mutual information. But for that, we need to have a, I think you, you have, you have already encountered this mutual information in the lectures in the last week. We have two regions now, and we construct this EIB as S, the entropy of A plus the entropy of B minus the entropy of AB, the union of the two. When I, I write AB is just the union. And, and this is, it is evident that the derivation pieces here that are local on the boundary will be in both the entropy of A and in the entropy of AB because it's local. And because it's, ex it's extensive, it's a sum over the boundary, it will exactly cancel between these two. So this is finite. And one can argue also that it's well-defined independent of the cutoff. This will throw out things like the, um, the corner terms you had before or no? Well, the corner terms, you, you would have to do the following to obtain this coefficient from the mutual. So uh, what, what I'm saying now is that the mutual information is always finite and when defined. So, and it's constructed out of the entropy. So there is a lot of information in the entropy, not just the logarithmic pieces, but a lot of information that is, con is, is in the finite piece that you can extract with the mutual information, right? In particular, you can ask, you can ask is every universal information can be extracted with the mutual information? And the answer is, is yes. For example, the logarithmic term. So le let, me, let me say something more. Okay, so, so let me say something more, um, more general. We can, we can construct the following thing. You, you can take a region A and you can take a region that is just outside, just outside A, let's call it B, and this distance epsilon, let's call it epsilon. And, and you can compute the mutual information and then this thing will approach something that heuristically is twice the entropy of A. So in fact, it will be some, some constant, some area term over epsilon square plus some other terms, where now epsilon is a physical scale. It's a physical scale. In, in drawing this picture, I have taken my lattice size to zero already. This epsilon is not the lattice size. It's a physical distance. When I do that, I expect to have something like twice the entropy. In fact, it diverges if I take epsilon going to zero. But now the coefficient here is completely universal. The coefficient is completely universal. And the idea, the heuristic idea behind this identification, like, mutual information as a universal regularization is that uh, when you do that, when you do this, this um, when you do this approach, you have, uh, And you can say, well, as the two regions are, are some, somehow very near complementary to each one, this is equal to SB, SA, sorry. While this is the entropy of the full space, then I think there is no gap here. So you can say, well, heuristically, this is zero. It is not zero. In fact, it kills the divergence in the other terms, but it doesn't have any long distance information, this piece, because the entropy of AB is just the entropy of the strip because the entropies of complementary regions are equal. And this strip 
does not have any um, long distance uh, correlators, let's say. So in some sense, what you ask uh, was, uh, how can I, um, how, how can I get, for example, the logarithmic term of the vertices with the mutual information? Well, I, we have to take a square, for example, and another square and do the mutual information between these two. And it will contain the area term and then we will contain some logarithmic term. With the coefficient here, that will be exactly the one that we got for the entropy, except for a, for, for a, a, a two, a factor of two there. So this is a picture, for example, for the for the free scalar in two plus one dimensions. You 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 get you have uh, two circles, which is very bad for uh, you have a circle and you increase the size of the circle, it will start everything start uh, oscillating because of the lattice points. Uh, but if you compute the mutual information, you get something that pretty nicely converges to a, to a fixed value quite fast. While the entropy does not con does not converge to anything, it's, it always fluctuates. <clears throat> well, the the second point that that was for the entropy. So what what does survive the continuum limit for the entropy? Well, the mutual information, for example, and other things that you you don't need to think about the mutual information, like the logarithmic terms, but they are, they can also be computed with the mutual information. Uh, what about the, the algebras of operators? Well, if you have, if you have a region, then you can form una, an algebra just by generating it with a smear fields, where this is a, a test function. So this produces an operator and multiplying and doing linear combinations of these operators in the region, you have an algebra. Uh, and these algebras are, are, are in, the, in the, these are normal algebras of, of uh, Hilbert spaces in, in, the, in the lattice model, but in the limit, they, they turn out to be some quite funny mathematical objects that are called type three von Neumann algebras. Um, so I, I will not talk about this more, but uh, what I want to, to, to say is that um, it's not, the, the, these objects are, are not the algebras usually encounter or the, the algebra operators one encounters in, in finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. Um, um, but uh, the, I think this is not really um, a very, a very important point in order to think about the things, in order to think about the entropy. We have, uh, if, you, if we have a, a lattice or, or, or a cutoff model, we can always think in, in a pedestrian terms with finite dimensional uh, algebras. Um, but the third point I want to make is what happens with the density matrix. in the continued limit. Well, uh, the state, the state is okay, right? It, there is no problem with the state in the continued limit. We know, for example, how to compute some expectation value, if, for example, the vacuum state, no, no problem. But the density matrix is a different thing the density matrix is something that allows me co to compute expectation values through a trace, right? We would like to have a, in, in some region to compute that D thing. Well, the density matrix does not exist. In the continuum limit.
And the reason is, is uh, simply is simply because it's, it's similar. The reason is similar, for example, uh, to suppose you have a, a state for a qubit. And you want to produce a state that is just for many, many degrees of freedom. It's just the same state tensor product. In the limit of infinite number of degrees of freedom, uh, you, you will see that uh, rho, all the, all the, all the eigenvalues, of rho go to zero. So uh, the eigenvalues of rho are the products of the eigenvalues of rho one, of the different rho ones there. And then uh, the all eigenvalues go to zero. So it cannot be a, a, a density matrix. A density matrix has to have positive eigenvalues whose sum is one, right? So, but this is, this is not a problem in the sense that, um, you can, you can use um, uh, a lattice or, or some regularization, or what really replaces the density matrix. So the, the, you, you can see that the density matrix is something, something that was provided for you by the state. And it's not just a state, it's something else from the state. It's something, in this case of the density matrix, it's, it's, just, it's an operator in the algebra, it's a density matrix that is provided for you by the state. You don't have any more that here, but you, you have a, something, something else that replaces it that is called the modular flow. Let me, let me describe it first. If I have a density matrix, I can write it in this way as an exponential of some Hermitian operator. So K is equal to minus low rho. And K, we call it the modular Hamiltonian. Somehow because in the thermal state, uh, we have rho is proportional to E to the minus, minus beta H. So the modular Hamiltonian would be beta H. Um, and then we, we can produce a, a unitary with just imaginary powers of the density matrix as, as if we were doing like time evolution, time evolution operator, if we have your Hamiltonian, if your model Hamiltonian is proportional to the Hamiltonian, this will be proportional to the to the time evolution operator. But this is this time evolution operator is generated by the state in, in some algebra, in some algebra of local operators in a, in a region. So it's, it's, some, uh, it's some symmetry generated by the state itself. So what, what survives in the continuum limit is just this unitary information So this is for the case where I have a density matrix, but in general, there is a unitary transformation or O tau uh, in general, in general, in the, in the continuum limit two. Some question? Are you saying that the, the the transformation of the algebra of operators exists, but the unitary operator u tau itself doesn't exist? No, the unitary operator does exist. Does exist. It does not belong to the algebra, but it does exist. Uh, so the so what, what I'm saying is that the automorphism. Sorry, it's not correct what I said. The automorphism of the algebra exists. Uh, um, what did that? It, the unitary you can construct if you purify your state in, in, a, in a full Hilbert space, let's say, 
but it's not an operator that belongs to the algebra itself right? in the in the in the continu in the continuum limit in the in the this in the, in the finite case of course is given by this and it belongs to the algebra it's just exponentials of the density matrix so let me then um, let me then um, um, describe uh, a method to compute the um, I don't have much time. I said up to three, right? It's eight minutes, right? Yeah, about eight minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, well, I don't know. If people have questions, I will, I will answer the question. Otherwise, I will start with a, I, I, will, I will be doing this. If, if someone has, to, has a question, just. So, I will describe a method to compute the entanglement entropy that is adapted to the continuum directly and uses the path integral. So the, the first thing is that we have the, the vacuum state we can describe through the path integral in Euclidean time just by doing the path integral this is time equals zero doing the path integral in the lower half of the Euclidean plane so and how is that we have that this is a vacuum wave functional I think the, the value of the field here is alpha x. So the vacuum will function and will be a functional of this alpha x. And this is defined as this, um, the, the scalar product, the wave function of the vacuum. This is the variable. And this is some normalization. And the path integral uh, up to time, time equal to zero, where I put the boundary condition equal to alpha x. So we integrate over the lower half of the Euclidean plane up to a boundary condition that give me the variable in the wave functional. So you can do this um, in ordinary quantum mechanics and you get the, the, the wave function of the fundamental state. Why is the fundamental state? Because you have integrated over the lower half of the Euclidean plane. So it projects everything to the lowest energy because uh, as, as we are in uh, imaginary time, the, what will be the, the exponential e E times energy times time, it, it gets negative. So it, it projects everything to the lowest energy in the state of the Hamiltonian. So what, now we have the, the, the wave functional of the uh, fundamental state. You can, you can uh, uh, define the, the vacuum density matrix. doing the trace of the outside part of the projector of the vacuum. So we have now two copies, two copies of the vacuum. One is the integral over the lower half. We have another copy integrating here, the path integral. We have our region V and the trace over the complement means that we are taking these two boundary conditions equal and integrating over that. So the, we are suing the plane over there. 
So we have, in fact, two boundaries here at equal to zero. And then the density matrix depends on these two boundary conditions that we can put an alpha, alpha minus here and an alpha plus here, two boundary conditions. Okay, so we have constructed the density matrix using the path integral. It's a path integral of the whole plane, the whole Euclidean plane, except the boundary that is located in, as in a cut along the, the region itself. Now, is, now we want to compute the entropy of this, but this is difficult because you have to put a logarithm here and do the trace. So, People have uh, have thought in different in doing some different computation instead of computing the entropy, computing traces of rho to the n. For example, rho cube. So the trace of rho cube. So as rho corresponds to one plane with a cut, we now have to use three copies of the plane with a cut. All in the region V, the three cuts. And now in order to compute rho to the cube, you, you have to multiply these density matrices. And for example, multiply will mean that the, the output variable of one of them is equal to the input variable of the other. And the output variable of this one will be equal to the input variable of the, of the, of the next one. And finally, the trace will mean that this output variable here is equal to the first one of the first copy. This crosses means one cross, one cross, it means that the values of the field are in, identified in this point. So we, we are defining, in fact, here a manifold with three copies. It's a, it's a multi sheeted manifold th that is. Uh, identify in a particular way um, around the, uh, the region V. Let me do some um, some um, say something about this particular manifold. The first thing is that there is no cut. There is no cut anymore. Why? Because if I let me do this. If I take, for example, this point and take a round here, take a, a trip here, I cross the one, one uh, cross boundary and then I get out here. And I take the round and I get again into the same boundary and go up here. So I started from here, I have uh, described a circle and I after a circle of two pi, I uh, return to the original point as is usual in any in the Euclidean plane. So there is no, there is no, there is nothing. It seems to be something there in the cut, but in fact there is nothing in the cut. However, however, if I instead of that I take um, a curve here around one of the board boundaries. I start, I cross the three, the three uh, crosses and then I get out here. 
I cross the two crosses boundary and then I get out here. I cross the one cross boundary and then I finally get out again here. So I, I in fact, I describe it three circles, three circles instead of one. So there is something, there is something here peculiar in the boundary. There is a singularity that is called a conical singularity. If you, if you go around the circle, you get uh, a different angle than two pi. So there is a conical singularity. of angle two pi times n, n is the, is the number of copies or the power of the density matter here was three and located at the boundary of the region, at the boundary of the region. Horacio, is there enough? Yeah, yeah, my time is, okay. is over. Yes. So uh, I, I will stop here, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks. All right, thanks a lot Horacio. Uh, maybe we can take a, a, a couple of quick questions. Any, any quick questions? Uh, I probably just missed this, but when we defined the modular flow, what was the interpretation of it? So we said we had this O tau and you evolve it with this unitary that depends on rho. So you evolve in a way that's dependent on the state or? Yeah, the, if you change the state, your, your, uh, your automorphism of the algebra it will, will change. Yeah, depends on the state. Okay, thank you. Any more quick questions? Manifold genus zero? The um, manifold has zero zero. Okay. Uh, well, <laughs> no, I, I know. Uh, so if you are, so it's a, it's a manifold that is singular, right? It's a, in order to say that this has some genus, you, you are talking about some, um, something that you can deform. Um, uh, so you are, for example, in a, in a conformal field theory, you can deform these things to, um, to, to a manifold with, with some genus, right? And no, it doesn't have a genus zero, no. Um, uh, I don't remember exactly what is the genus, but it depends, for example, in two dimensions, if you have a, your region is, it has one cut or many cuts. So you have one interval or many intervals. You can, you can talk about regions one with any intervals, any number of intervals. And then the, the genus depends on the number of intervals and on the N, on the N of the, the power of the density matrix. I have a question also about the modular flow. The way I understood what you said is that um, in the continuum theory, we might not necessarily be able to define density matrices. So instead we're associating states to automorphisms, but I don't understand why you're choosing that particular automorphism with the logarithm of the density matrix to be the the Hamiltonian, like, uh, can't we define it in a lot of other ways? Why, why in particular this way? Uh, it seems well, quite arbitrary the, that you're choosing to take the logarithm of the density matrix. You could do anything else. Well, is the is the um, is is a power of the density matrix. In fact, the, this is unitary, right? So it's the power of the density matrix. The, the logarithm of the density, well, the logarithm of the density matrix is the generator. Yeah, that's right? what I mean. The generator, exactly. Um, 
if, if you have uh, other things, it may be, you, maybe you can produce other structures out of the state in, a, in an algebra. Surely there are other things, but um, this is a, this is known, this is, a, this is there, and somehow is, is exactly coming from the density matrix in some sense, is exactly what you get from the density matrix, right? Um, I don't know if, if there are other structures that you can uh, obtain, or you are, you are asking why the logarithm, why the generator is the logarithm. No, no, I just mean why, per, why this particular form? Uh, why the exponential? Why? Okay. Why, yeah. Well, you you can say, for example, I, I, as I, I you know, as, as a question will be, for example, if, if you, uh, I, I said in the limit of the continuum, you don't have a, um, the, the, the eigenvalues go to zero, something is happening, you have to normalize such a way that the, the trace of the density matrix doesn't have any sense anymore. Mm -hmm. So uh, one thing is that this, um, when you do this, it doesn't matter if you normalize your density matrix with some number. The normalization doesn't matter because it cancels, right? You can put, So cancel normalization. So it, it, you can see that this will, will go through the continuum limit. This transformation of the operators will survive to the continuum limit because it doesn't, or, or in, in the example that I showed you before that you have a product of density matrices for single qubits, right? Uh, in that case, it's, it's trivial that each density matrix will produce a unitary transformation of each qubit. Uh, what is not defined is, the, is the, the density matrix of the whole thing together, right? But the, the transformation is unitary and you can multiply any number of unitaries and then it will somehow will be also a automorphism of the algebra. I mean, th uh, this form, can I maybe, this form also satisfies the KMS condition, right? So yeah, sure, yeah. Nothing else would I, do I that. I, I know you didn't say that. The, no, no, I, I didn't say mm -hmm. that. So uh, if you have this, there is a way to define this automorphism of the algebra that depends on the state that is um, that is uh, that is the is, is a condition on the on the correlators. So you have a two two operators. And then you can think what happens with a, where just you are just a, a modular evolving one of them, right? And if you modular evolve this uh, this operator in an imaginary parameter, now you there is a way to um, uh, analytically continue this operator in the parameter tau. Uh, complex now, you can put one, and now you put I, right? Uh, and this thing will be exactly the same as the original one, except for the ordering. So there is a periodicity in machinery time. Which is exactly the same periodicity that you found you find in the thermal partition function that Alex Maloney was talking about. There is a periodic Euclidean time of period beta. Well, here is is a is periodic in period one. Let's say because it's normalized in this way, we have put the density matrix to e to the minus k. If we, if we have put a beta there, there would be a beta here, right? Uh, so it's exactly the, the thing that is defining that your density matrix 
instead of defining the density matrix, you can, you can say, uh, 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 instead of defining the thermal density matrix, you can say, my, my, um, the, I have a one parameter group of, um, of symmetries that uh, uh, makes the, the correlation functions periodic in imaginary time of some given period. So th this was invented first by, by not by quant people interested in, in quantum field theory, but people interested in the, in the large volume limit of thermodynamical system, because it's the same problem. In that, in that limit, you don't have any more a density matrix because you have infinitely many degrees of freedom, even in a lattice. And then you want to define what is a thermal equilibrium state in that limit. And then uh, people invented this KMS condition in, is, 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 a, is a way to say that the state is in a thermal equilibrium at some temperature, uh, even if you don't have the thermal density matrix. Okay, so it's just a mathematical definition. I don't have to think about any physical meaning behind it. And somehow it's going to be useful. Well, uh, we, will, we will have the time to, I think, to enter into some, we will see what this modular flow is in some cases, some example. Okay. Right. And then that will be more, more interesting in that case. Okay. For, in the, in the, for a thermal state, it's just the time evolution, usual time. It's proportional to time. So it's kind of internal time of your algebra. It's a kind of internal time of your algebra that is uh, generated by the state itself. Okay, um, I think I think time's up. So um, okay. uh, let's thank Horatio again. And um, yeah, I don't know if you're available now, but there might be some other questions which students are more comfortable. Okay, uh, so I without I recording. Remain here. Well, you know, if you have if you're available, that'd be great. Um, okay, and we'll see if yeah, but.